On July 16, 1945, the most fascinating and terrifying experiment in the history of physics took place, the Trinity Test. Sitting atop of a 30-meter steel tower, the experimental device codenamed the Gadget consisted of a collection of high explosives carefully designed and arranged to detonate and turn the 32 initial shockwaves inside out to crush a ball of plutonium-239 of 9 centimeters in diameter into a supercritical state containing a grape-sized mixture of beryllium and polonium in the center. Chemistry was in charge of this assembly stage, then nuclear physics took over. The beryllium-polonium initiator produced a burst of neutrons that showered the now ultra-dense plutonium, producing an exponentially growing number of neutrons that fission the plutonium nuclei, each releasing more energy and more neutrons, which in turn led to more fission, a runaway chain of nuclear reactions. After a few microseconds, the extreme temperature completely vaporized the steel tower and melted the desert sand, and the intense ionizing radiation stripped the air molecules of their electrons. X-rays, gamma rays, and an intense flash confirmed that the experiment worked. Finally, a strong shockwave with a destructive power to shatter an entire city emanated from where a steel tower once existed and the bright fireball raised, producing a now characteristic mushroom cloud. Humanity entered the nuclear age and the world was never the same. Most testimonials from the eyewitnesses of the test emphasize the brightness of the fireball and how the explosion illuminated the mountains more than daylight. Brighter than a thousand suns became a standard to describe the visible radiation during the test. This even became the title of a well-known but highly controversial book about the American and German nuclear programs during World War II, as well as a song by Aaron Maiden, whose lyrics make a clear reference to the Trinity test. But how bright was it? Thomas Farrell, General Grove's deputy commander, described the explosion as light with the intensity many times that of the midday sun. And Ben Benjamin, engineer from the optics group in charge of photography during the Trinity test, described it as brighter than 20 suns. Footage shows that it was clearly very bright, but how much? Was it really a thousand suns? The yield of the explosion of the Trinity test was estimated at around 20 kilotons. This is the equivalent of 20,000 tons of TNT. This TNT equivalent is a standard unit of energy used in blast engineering, where 1 kiloton is equivalent to 4.184 terajoules. Therefore, the yield of the gadget was around 8.37 times 10 to the 13 joules. Let's try to estimate the fraction of this energy released in the form of visible light. One of the most established documents about this topic is the Effects of Nuclear Weapons Report by Samuel Gladstone, published in 1977. The section about the energy distribution of a nuclear explosion describes An approximate rule of thumb for a fission weapon exploded in the air at an altitude of less than 40,000 feet is that 35% of the explosion energy is in the form of thermal radiation. Let's consider that only one half of the thermal energy produces photons of visible wavelengths, while the rest goes to produce light invisible to the human eye. With this, the energy available to produce visible light is 8.37 10 to the 13 joules times 0 0.35 times 0 0.5 which gives 1.46 times 10 to the 13 joules. During a nuclear explosion, the high intensity radiation is mostly emitted in the first few milliseconds, but the bright fireball is visible for a second or two. Let's suppose that the above energy is released during the first second. This allows estimating the luminosity of the visible fireball as a ratio between the energy and time, which gives 1.46 times 
times 10 to the 13 watts. The military personnel invited to witness the Trinity test were located at the base camp, around 16 kilometers from ground zero, while most of the scientific observers were stationed at the three observation bunkers 10,000 yards from the tower. The energy calculated above was emitted in all directions. We can get the energy flux at a given distance r, dividing the luminosity by the spherical area at that distance. So the flux is given by the luminosity divided by 4 pi times the square of the distance. In this case, we get roughly 14,000 watts per square meter, which we can write as 14 kilowatts per square meter. We can now compare this value to the solar flux of visible light that we receive on Earth. This is a well-measured quantity that plays a key role in the deployment of photovoltaic power and is commonly known as the solar constant. Its value is 1.4 kilowatts per square meter. With all the approximations used, the ratio between visible light from Trinity and the average daylight sun is around 10. This result implies that the fireball of the Trinity test during the first second was as bright as 10 suns. This is somewhere between the subjective estimates from Benjamin and Farrell mentioned earlier, and a few orders of magnitude less than the popular 1000 suns. The official report on the Trinity test was highly classified, but a sanitized version was released in 1976. Section 9.3, titled Analysis of the Emitted Light, states that for the first second, the total radiant energy density received at 10,000 yards was 1.2 times 10 to the 7 x per square centimeter, plus minus 15%. With this uncertainty, the measured flux at the Trinity test was somewhere between 10.2 and 13.8 kilowatts per square meter which shows that our estimate at 13.9 kilowatts per square meter was quite good, despite all the rough approximations. So there we have it. We can say that the brightness of the Trinity test was close to 10 suns. But a follow-up question is where does this 1000 suns quote come from? It turns out that this is related to one of the most famous quotes about the Trinity test by the scientific director of the Manhattan Project, Robert Oppenheimer. In a recorded interview in 1965, Oppenheimer described how after Trinity, some people celebrated and others were silent. Well, he remembered a line from the Bhagavad Gita that has been immortalized. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Like most people, for years, I assumed that Oppenheimer saw himself as a destroyer of worlds because of his role in the development of such a destructive weapon. This appears as the obvious interpretation and the one pushed by every article and documentary that uses the quote. In 2014, I read an interesting article by nuclear historian Alex Wellerstein describing how this is probably a misinterpretation of Oppenheimer's words. Wallerstein cites an article by James Ihia, published by the American Philosophical Society in the year 2000. Ihia begins his article calling Oppenheimer's words one of the most cited and least interpreted quotations from the history of the atomic age. According to Ihia, the line mentioned by Oppenheimer is a version of a passage in the Hindu scripture about a human prince called Arjuna and a succession war, in which cousins fight for the throne. Arjuna doesn't want to go to battle, because he must fight against his family and friends. Arjuna tells his friend Krishna, which is one of the human incarnations of God Vishnu, that he refuses to kill these people that are so close to him. But the god reminds him that he is a soldier, and fighting this war is his duty. After accepting, Arjuna asks his friend to see his godlike form. The translation presented by Ihiya opens with a thousand simultaneous suns arising in the sky. After Arjuna worships the god, Krishna tells Arjuna why he is there. Dead am I, 
and my present task, distraction. Here we find the inspiration of Oppenheimer's words, a more sophisticated and poetic version of the famous quote. But more importantly, with context, it is clear that Oppenheimer does not see himself as the god with the power to destroy worlds, but rather as Arjuna, a human whose place in society puts him in an undesirable position that would lead to death and destruction of others like him. However, he accepts his duty. In other words, Oppenheimer is not the destroyer of worlds, but rather the simple human that must accept his role. He doesn't want to, but it is his duty, in this case, to build a bomb. Ihiya writes, He was a scientist, so it was his duty to make judgments on scientific matters, like how to build a bomb. But when it came to politics and war, he refused to oppose decisions made by people seemingly more qualified than himself. He knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says now I am become death the destroyer of worlds I suppose we all thought that one way or another 